Hi folks, today we're gonna to talk about inverse trig. So to think about inverse trig, first we need to think about uh, what it means to be solving an equation. So here is an equation that is not a trig equation that you do know how to solve. Uh, it's the equation x squared equals 25. How would you solve this? Probably most of us would take the square root of both sides write that x is the plus or minus positive or negative square root of 25, and that would mean that x is 5 or negative 5. And it's actually this idea of having multiple answers that's uh, the important difference between solving an equation and using an inverse function, which is what we're going to use when we use the inverse trig. Um, so let's solve a trig equation. So just remember, you know, here with our x squared, we got two answers. Let's solve this trig equation. Uh, say I'm solving the equation sine of theta equals one half. My job here is to find all solutions, theta. So how do I do that? Uh, you could consider drawing maybe a little reference triangle. I happen to remember that when the opposite side is one and the hypotenuse is two, that angle is a 30 degree angle, or in radians, a pi over 6 angle. Um, but that's not the only potential angular solution. I could have also drawn that triangle with the same positive side lengths of 1 and 2 over in quadrant 2, and then the angle that I would be finding would be the large angle made with the positive x-axis, and in that case then theta, I'm going to call this like theta 2, because it's the second solution, would be 5 pi over 6, or 150 degrees if you're in degree mode. So not a, I have two solutions, 5 pi over 6 and pi over 6, but actually, technically, I have way more solutions than that, because I could have pi over 6 plus a full rotation, uh, pi over 6 plus 2 pi, and I could have any number of full rotations that I want. So like if I wanted to write all solutions to this, I'd have to write theta is pi over six plus two pi n, and theta is five pi over six plus two pi, and any number of rotations around after that. Um, and I would make the note here, n is an integer. So that's how you solve an equation with a trig like that. That might be what's most familiar to you. It seems like the most logical thing to do. Uh, we're actually going to cover this more in Chapter 5, uh, where we're finding all solutions to equations such as this. But I want to talk today more about uh, inverse trig, something like find sine inverse of x. And to do that, I want to go back to our square root example. Uh, so say that instead of having you solve x squared equals 25, I instead gave you a function that was the inverse of x squared, and I called that function square root of x, and I said compute f of 25. Well then, what I would do is I would say f of 25, uh, 25 means plug that in for x, so it would be the square root of 25. Now the square root was already there. The author of this problem, which was me, did not put a plus or minus on that square root. In fact, this is a function. which means each in can have one out only. So if I write square root of 25 and I say this is a function and I were to write plus or minus 5, I would be breaking the rules of a function because I would have two answers, which is why we have that rule that this is assumed to be the positive root, this is assumed to be the positive root, and the only answer here is 5. Now. Uh, We've made some sacrifices. We kind of like lost an answer. So we lost negative five as an answer. But what we gained is that uh, square root of x is a function, which it was not a function before. So we're gonna do a similar thing with sine inverse and trig inverse. We're going to lose some of the extra answers that we would otherwise get by restricting the outputs. And what we'll gain instead is that this will now actually function as a function. That's a fun one. Um, it will behave as a function, 
And so we're actually able to uh, treat it like a function, compute its graph, find a single answer. And that's like a lot of the big theme of, you know, pre-calculus and calculus is modeling things, not just as, you know, equations, but actually modeling them as real functions that behave in all the ways you'd expect functions to behave. So how would I solve this using the sine inverse function? Well, I would compute f of one half. So what I'm really trying to do is sine inverse of one half. And this is equal to something. And what this is saying is uh, the angle where sine theta is equal to one half. We already computed where those angles are. It was pi over six and five pi over six. And that's kind of like when I did the square root, I said plus or minus. What I'm gonna to do to answer this question, and we'll talk about why a little bit later, is just select the answer that's closest to zero here. So the single answer for sine inverse of one half is just pi over six. And by selecting that only answer, it lets us avoid ambiguity. If I ask you a uh, sine of inverse of one half and you ask someone else sine inverse of one half and that other person asks another person sine inverse of one half, you will all arrive at the same answer. There's no such, there won't be anyone else saying five pi over six as long as we agree to follow the same rules. And again, why did we choose pi over six instead of five pi over six as the one answer to report? Well, we'll talk about that later in the video. Um, so just hang on with me for a little bit. But I want to talk now about some of the weird notational things going on here just to warn you about uh, things that people get confused on. So this notation that we are using and you've been using, you see it on your calculator, is often voted you know, like on, on web forums and web threads as the worst notation in all of mathematics. Um, and we are unable to change it. We have to deal with it. Um, but here's why it's the worst notation. Is in other contexts, this negative one is implied to be a reciprocal, like one over that, you know, if this was an exponent problem, two to the negative one would be one half. Um, this is not a reciprocal, and it's actually made worse because sine of x to the negative one where the negative one is on the outside is a reciprocal. And we actually have reciprocal functions for sine of x, that's cosecant of x. So we actually do find ourselves frequently taking reciprocals of sine functions and cosine and tangent. Um, and we have notation for the reciprocals of those functions, but it's not the same as this sine inverse notation. Um, so just be really careful of that. Remember that it's not an exponent. Always slow down and think about what this is asking. One way that people will get around this is they will write sine inverse. They'll be like, this is terrible notation you know what, I'm gonna get rid of that and I'm gonna call that function because this is a function. They're gonna call that function arc sine of x. And I actually like this notation, that's what I like to use. Um, but the problem is, is your calculator doesn't have space for arc sine, so they use sine inverse. So as long as we're still using calculators, we couldn't get rid of that bad notation entirely. We're kind of stuck with it. Um, but when you're doing stuff by hand, you can definitely use arc sine notation. Why is it called arc sine? Well, uh, the key word here is arc. Remember that when we were talking about radians and learning about radians, there was a key relationship between the length of the arc and the angle that it created. And since arcs are related to angles, the idea here is that this is kind of like saying angle sine of x, or find me the angle. And that's what these arc signs do. And when I say arc sign, I also mean um, arc cosine, arc tangent. You can have uh, arc secant. Those show up way less frequently, all the reciprocal ones. Those, these are the main three. And you can think about these as being sine inverse. Nope cosine inverse, tangent inverse, and sine inverse. These all mean the same thing whenever you see them. Um, so let's think about these as functions. Um, I'm going to pick on just the cosine function for now. So if you've ever seen the drawing of a function as a machine with inputs and outputs, I think that's the most helpful way to think about this trig and really understand it. 
So the idea is a function is a machine. You have stuff that goes in and you have stuff that comes out. And the question is, what kind of stuff goes in and what kind of stuff goes out? We'll start with just cosine of x. What kind of stuff goes into cosine? Well, think about what we compute. Stuff like cosine of 30 degrees or cosine of 7 pi over 5. The things that go in are angles. Are the inputs to cosine. And the things that come out of cosine, well, what do we get when we usually do cosine? We do cosine of 30 and we get 1 half. Uh, we do cosine of something else, we get 0 0.638, you know, a decimal on our calculator. Uh, sometimes we get cosine of 0, sometimes we get negative 1. Uh, it appears that what we get out are numbers, and I'm going to call, you can think about them as numbers um, between 0, uh, actually negative 1 and 1, but you can also think about them as side lengths. of a triangle. So if I got out, cosine is one half, what this is telling me is there's some angle where there's a side and uh, cosine was adjacent over hypotenuse. So one half would look something like that, not to scale. Let's think about inverse cosine. And this would be true for inverse tangent and inverse uh, sine as well, at least the big idea here. Inverse cosine has to do the opposite of cosine. So it's going to have as inputs side lengths or ratios. And for cosine, it's going to be uh, between negative 1 to 1 in interval notation. Um, but those that differs for the, depending on the function you're looking at. And what will come out of this arc cosine function? The output is going to be angles. So we, when we have these arc functions or inverse functions, we are going to input side lengths and receive as outputs angles. And it's really important that you recognize the difference between normal trig and inverse trig in terms of like how it functions and what it takes in and what it puts out. Because when we start getting into these really complicated situations, it's going to be important to understand what sort of things are angles and what sort of things are sides, and how you can use those to label uh, pictures and label triangles. So all of that preamble aside, this brings us to the main idea, which is restricting the outputs of inverse trig functions and how we're going to do it, uh, and why we chose the answer we did out of all those possible answers. So the idea here is that where for any given input, say I input one half into arc sine, or I input negative root three over two into arc cosine, or I input negative one into arc tangent, those should give me exactly one output that everyone can always predict. Um, and so in the section of the video, we're going to talk about how we choose and agree on the outputs that we want to give as our agreed upon outputs. So a couple things that initially make sense. One, it makes sense to restrict our outputs to uh, the initial trip around a circle, 0 to 2 pi. You know, all angles can live in one full trip around the circle, so it doesn't make sense to do any larger or positive or negative coterminals to those angles. And it actually is going to make the most sense to kind of restrict our angles to be as close to 0 as we want. And the reason we would do that is because trig here, in this sense, is really about triangles. And so, you know, triangles make the most sense in quadrants like 1, 2, and 3, kind of. Or, uh, and they don't make very much sense over here in quadrant uh, quadrant 3. I said 1, 2, 3. I meant 1, 4, and 3. 1, 2, and 4. I'm just saying numbers now. So if I am inputting a positive number into any of these three inverse trig functions, for example, uh, I'm doing arc sine of positive one-half or arc cosine of uh, positive root three over two. And those actually give me the same angle. Um, what I'm really saying is, okay, here's a function. I'm putting in a triangle. I'm putting in a triangle with opposite side one and hypotenuse two. And I'm saying, what's my output? Some angle theta. 
So it's saying, what's the angle theta of that triangle? Well, if all the sides are positive in this triangle, it makes a lot of sense for that angle to live in quadrant one. The other place where sine is positive is quadrant two, question mark. But if I were to choose the quadrant two angle, that would be, and I exclude the quadrant one angle, that would just be silly. Why would you do that? So we're definitely going to include the quadrant one angle. So if you're inputting a positive number into the arc sine, cosine, or tangent functions, your output will be an angle in quadrant one because it's talking about a triangle with all positive side lengths and it just makes sense to choose that triangle as our choice. So we're going to select quadrant one angles as outputs for positive inputs. Now let's talk about cosine. And specifically, we're kind of trying to deal with what would happen if I did uh, arc cosine of negative one half. Arc cosine of negative one half and decide which answer I should choose when I'm inputting a negative value. Well, remember cosine of x uh, and how it behaves throughout the quadrants. Cosine is positive wherever x is positive and negative wherever x is negative. Right, so that's like the, the kind of sine chart for cosine depending on the quadrant. So a quadrant one angle will have positive cosine, a quadrant two angle will have negative cosine, quadrant three negative, quadrant four positive for those different quadrants and types of angles. Now I said before that I want to select, I know what quadrant I'm going to choose if my angle input is positive. I'm going to choose quadrant one. Right, so here I'm talking about, on this drawing, I'm kind of talking about the outputs of cosine. But what I could also be talking about is the inputs. Remember that it's an inverse function, so it switches inputs and outputs. I could be talking about the inputs of arc cosine. So if I'm deciding if I have a positive input for arc cosine, the output will be a quadrant one angle. Uh, now I have to decide what happens if I have a negative input, so I have to choose basically between quadrants 2 and 3. Does it make sense to choose a quadrant 3 angle when often with trig you're trying to create triangles? There's really only one quadrant that, in addition to quadrant 1, it makes sense to draw triangles in of those two, and it's quadrant 2, right? Because you can still draw a quadrant 2 triangle with uh, an obtuse angle, so like that's a perfectly valid triangle. It's not a reference triangle, but it's a perfectly valid triangle uh, with an obtuse angle. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to select and agree that quadrant two will be the outputs. So if my input is negative, my output will be a quadrant two angle for inverse cosine. And let's restate that in a different way. For the function f of x is cosine inverse of x, which is often written as arc cosine of x, same function. The domain is going to be numbers from negative 1 to 1, because we're taking side lengths as the input. That we knew, but the range is going to be angles from 0 up to pi, inclusive of potentially 0 or pi. So you will, uh, from that input domain, you will only ever get, uh, either receive or give answers in the range from 0 to pi, because we have selected a positive quadrant and a negative quadrant and that takes care of all the quadrants we need to deal with. We are just going to take those bottom two quadrants and throw them out. We're going to ignore them as possible output quadrants for the function arc cosine of x. One last thought on arc cosine. I said if you have a positive input, you get a quadrant one angle as the output. If you have a negative input, you get a quadrant two angle as the output. 
What if you have a zero input? Then you're going to get an output of, well, when's cosine zero? Exactly in the middle of the quadrants at the angle pi over two. So that's like one kind of special case that's neither positive or negative um, that we don't really have to worry about, but kind of shows up. So I did cosine first there because cosine inverse has different rules than the other two. Um, sine inverse sine and sine inverse and tangent and tangent inverse actually have the same uh, set of ranges, but let's go through one by one. So let's do sine. Remember how sine is positive in quadrant one, and since it's the y, it's also positive in quadrant two. And then it's negative in the bottom two quadrants. So let's again think. If my input is a positive ratio, like 1 half or root 3 over 2, the output should be a quadrant 1 angle. Because for positive inputs, I should get a positive output. Quadrant 1 makes the most sense. It's the most logical place to be. Then what I have to ask myself is what are we going to do with negative ratios? Like negative 1 half or negative root 3 over 2 as inputs. Well, I've already selected the first quadrant as my positive quadrant. If I were to say, well, co cosine selected quadrant 2 as its other friendly quadrant, if I do that, look what I've done. I've highlighted two positive quadrants and no negative quadrants. So I'm actually going to introduce ambiguity. That's bad. For my negative ratios as inputs, I have to select from the options of quadrant 3 and quadrant 4. Well, again, quadrant 3 is not very logical. Why would you pick quadrant 3? when you have a perfectly logical quadrant four that like is right next to the zero line over there, you can draw lovely triangles in quadrant four if you think about negative angles. So we're going to select as our chosen quadrant of those two, quadrant four as our output. So if we have an input that's a negative ratio, our output will be a quadrant four angle. And that's just, just something we're agreeing on. It's kind of like when we agreed that you see square root of 25, what I mean is positive 5. That was an agreement so that we can have a function and avoid ambiguity. Here we are agreeing that if I do arc sine or sine inverse of negative 1 half, even though there's two potential options that you could give to me, you're going to give me the quadrant 4 angle. Um, now we're going to do something a little weird here. Because it would be weird to open angles all the way up and then skip, and skip, and then start counting our angles continually clockwise, like kind of having skipped two quadrants. That's just kind of awkward. So instead, we are going to say, what if we consider the uh, angle at 3 pi over 2 to just be negative pi over 2, or negative 90 degrees, and then take all angles from negative 90 degrees, negative pi over 2, to positive pi over 2, or positive 90 degrees. And that's going to be the actual kind of full uh, range of outputs, is going from negative to positive. Uh, so we'll say Q4 angle, but from negative pi over 2 up to 0. Uh, so we're going to give it as a negative angle. And the idea there is, again, um, Triangles with a negative 30 degree angle, I think you could understand where that goes and how it's positioned. But if I said, give me a triangle with a 330 degree angle, you would say, Mr. Eck, there's no such triangle. Triangles can only have 180 degrees or something like that. So uh, that's why we're choosing the negative angles here. Okay, so to kind of be a little more official, for arc sine or sine inverse of x, I'll write this as f of x. For the function sine inverse of x, which is often written as arc sine of x, the domain is uh, numbers from negative 1 up to 1, inclusive, and that's because those are the side lengths or ratios of a triangle opposite over hypotenuse, and the range are angles 
from negative pi over 2 up to pi over 2. If you're doing arc sine of something, you will only ever give angles answers in that range, ever. Okay, so there's one last trig function to talk about, our inverse trig function, it's tangent. Let's recall the uh, way that tangent changes sign. Tangent is positive in quadrant one, but also positive in quadrant three, negative in quadrant two, negative in quadrant four. So if we're going to identify the quadrants that we want to uh, have outputs in for inverse tangent, I need to pick a positive quadrant. Well, hey, let's pick quadrant one again. And I need to pick a negative quadrant. And I guess I could technically pick either of these two quadrants um, because I need a one positive and one negative. Um, and, you know, I think there's good arguments for both. But I will tell you that mathematics has selected quadrant four. So uh, we've decided that tangent is going to have the same range as inverse sine when we do this. So. And again, I'm going faster here because we've already kind of explained it. When you look at this, um, you know, we switched the plus and minus compared to all the other functions, but it, we're not worrying about those two quadrants, so it doesn't really matter that those have swapped, and that's why we're keeping that sine, uh, arc sine, arc tangent the same range as arc sine. So for the function f of x equals tangent inverse of x, which is often written as arc tangent of x, the domain is actually all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. I'll talk about that in just a sec. And the range is going to be angles from negative pi over 2 up to pi over 2 inclusive. And it actually turns out then for inverse tangent, the only thing that's that's really different from inverse sine is its domain. Why does this have domain of all real numbers? Well, remember that tangent is in Sokotoa land opposite over adjacent. And in a right triangle, since we're not dealing with like the longest side anymore, I could have a right triangle with an adjacent side, side that's really tiny and an opposite side that's really big. That gives us all the big numbers. I could have a right triangle with an adjacent side that's really big and an opposite side that's really tiny. That gives me all the small numbers. Um, and I could also, also, of course, have those be in other quadrants so that we get all the negative numbers. That's one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is for the graph of tangent x, what does the graph of tan x look like? It looks like this. What's the range of tangent? Negative infinity to infinity. Those are the possible tangent ratios. So when you switch to do in, doing inverse tangent, then that range becomes your domain when you're looking at tangent inverse. And just to recap, thank you all for staying with me for this long. This always takes a long time to teach and go over. It's just something that's a really complicated idea. So if you're feeling stuck on it, uh, try some problems and then maybe watch the video again when you do get stuck. Um, or just rewatch, you know, again and, and make notes of what questions you have and shoot me emails uh, with those questions that you do have. But I want to close out by doing just a nice recap of all the three functions we talked about today. So for the function, um, arc sine of x, which is also written as sine inverse of x, same thing. They have domain negative 1 to 1, and it has defined as having range. This is the one that's in quadrants uh, q4 and quadrant 1, so it goes from negative pi over 2 up to pi over 2. For the function cosine inverse of x, also named arc cosine of x, that also has domain set of inputs from negative 1 to 1. And it, this one has range in quadrants 1 and quadrants 2. And we talked about why that is earlier. 
So its range is going to go from 0 up to pi. You will never get outputs outside of 0 to pi if you're doing it correctly. And for the last function, tangent inverse of x, also called arc tangent of x, that has domain negative infinity up to infinity. We talked about why that is. And its range is going to be the same as uh, arc sine. It's going to have range in quadrants 4 and quadrant 1. You will only ever get angle outputs from negative pi over 2 up to positive pi over 2. Those are the three main functions. Um, we don't really often work with the reciprocal inverses because usually you can then just take the reciprocal and use one of these three. And honestly, this is enough information right now. So uh, in the, we, this is all we really need at this time. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, stay tuned for the next video. I told you this was a long topic. In the next one, this was uh, we're going to work out specific problems. This was all theory, but we're going to work out specific problems that use this idea of the range and the outputs.